Well, believe it or not, I used to love reading, and I still do to some extent. And I went to the local library where I lived in Kingston, Jamaica, and um, pulled out this book by Nat Fleischer, the former boxing historian, mm -hmm. called Heavyweight Champion of the World. And in this um, book you now that introduced me to boxing, I read about Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson was the first black heavyweight champion of the world. And because of the, the name, the color, what I mean is the race, same racial, ethnic group as myself, I said I was enlightened, enlightened by what he had read he had done. You know, being the first, you know, that's something a bit special as far as I'm concerned. And he was, and given at the time, the inhibitions that he had to win the heavyweight champion, when I say inhibitions, I mean the difficulties that he, you know, well past his best when he won the title. And um, I decided that, yes, I want to be a boxer. At the time, I could not be the world uh, first black heavyweight champion. Mm -hmm. So I decided to take half the world, British Empire that existed at the time, where I lived in Jamaica, was in my world that would have been sufficient. So I decided that when I came to England, I would become, become a boxer and become the first black heavyweight champion of Britain in this empire. And believe it or not, it happened. That was self-belief. When I came to this country as a 16-year-old, I started boxing. I found this club called All Amateur Boxing Club in central Birmingham, by Birmingham, close to Birmingham University. And uh, when I discovered this gym, I was so in, in line. I thought, yes, I'm going to start training. So I went to work the next morning, and I said to whoever was listening in the factory, I said, I found a gym. I'm going to start training. This is the following Monday after I had found the gym. I said, I'm going to start training. I'm going to be the first black hippie champion in Britain. And this lad said, if you do, I'll eat my hat, which was a very popular saying at the time, you know. You know, if you do, I'll eat my hat. And I said, all right, I'll show you. So that's a little story on self-belief, you know. Because yeah. I hadn't even had a fight, I hadn't started training. But yet I believed that I would. And I told everyone who would listen. All I can remember is... I somehow I ended up on the floor. You know, Danny Boy didn't put me down. I was so ecstatic. I didn't know what to do with myself because when those things happen, and when a dream come true, it's it's out of this world. You know, all I remember saying to this day, I somehow threw myself on the floor in ecstasy, and I'm saying I don't believe it because I was referring to the fact that I had said so confidently that I was going to be the first black boy champion of Britain, and then it happened. You know, so I, said, I, can't, I, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. That's all I can remember saying, you know, at yeah. the time. Well, it's very, tend to be sat on over here. I mean, at the time, the only other artist I've given this interview to that I had said I wanted to be the first Black Heavyweight Champion of Britain was when I went to Australia and I was giving an interview over there. This is about 1981. And, I, and that's the first time I can remember raising that issue of race and color, and, which was a very toxic, still is also depending on how you approach it. Mm -hmm. But at the time, in the 1970s, I did not at the time feel um, confident enough, you could say, to mention about race and black heavyweight champion. You know, they're going to say, oh, before you know, racism is being thrown at you because you mentioned the element of the issue of race. Not as an issue, but listen, I'm black and I'm proud and that sort of thing. You know, they would, they would think I'm a racist or something. So I thought better to leave it alone. Um, he wasn't a friend of mine, but in a way, whenever you fight anyone, there is a certain amount of bonding in a way. I was watching a, a fight last night, and I thought, incredible. One black guy, one white guy. Thumping the daylight out of each other. I tell you, it was so emotive. Still fine. And after, boom, the hands are on each other. 
Incredible. What other sport is like that? You thump, you try to knock him out, and then you have James Scott was not a very, well, the most nicest of person. He was in prison for uh, murder. He was on the 50, uh, 50 to 100 years. You know, the, the way in America, the way they talk, he probably would have been out in, in 10 or 15, but that's the way it is. Fighting the daylight out of you, think 100 years? <laughs> will I come out? <laughs> How will I get out of there? But um, he was unbeaten at the time. They wanted somebody with a name as such, you know, to keep his ranking in the top ten and to um, yeah, see him as a live contender, a dangerous contender, to sell tickets, American TV. My manager at the time, George Francis, came to me and said, oh, they want this fight. Uh, they want you to fight this guy in America. But, you know, towards the end of my career, they offered me $10,000 at the time. I wasn't really fit, fit. Um, if, you inv if you interview too many fighters, you'll hear they all say that whenever they lose a fight. But honestly, it's true. They hear them say that too. But the thing is, I was coming towards the end of my career, um, and... They often made me an offer, and I think I could protect myself well enough to go over there, give him a bit of a workout, and possibly if I'm lucky, I could win. But it wasn't a sort of fight I thought, yes, I'm definitely going to win. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about losing, because the other fight, you're going to be successful, you can't think about losing. You know, you've got to protect yourself, and that's the beginning, protecting yourself mentally. I cannot be beaten, I won't be beaten. However, you know, the realities of life, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. But yeah, it was a, an, an experience which was unique to me because not very often too many fighters fight in prison, you know. But they were, I think the, manager, the governor of the prison at the time were trying to experiment to see if he could get them, those tough guys, rehabilitated from inside the prison before they move out so they have something to do with, you know. And it was working, but... Um, that's another story which I don't know too much of. But I enjoyed going over there and, and the experience of fighting. All we, ha we had maybe about a thousand inmates outside in the yard. And guess who they shouted for? Yes, you got it. James Scott. <laughs> but um, I, did. I did. I fought as well as I could. Did my well. Did my bit. And, um, and left, you know. It's, it's one of these fights in which you protect yourself, you don't get hurt, you do as well as you can to satisfy the customer so that people will want to come back to you, a promoter or so, and say, will you take this fight? You know, but not one of my better performances because, as I said, apologetically early, earlier, it was towards the end of my career. <laughs>'ll be disappointed, but you know you have to I've been accustomed to a, a, having disappointments and then it passes and then you get down to it and get in the gym and you work at it again because that's the only way if you're disappointed every time, then you wouldn't last too long, so you have to put it behind you in looking at it, I went down to my more natural weight and fought and won the light of weight titles as well at, at the late stage in my career, which is, doesn't yeah. usually happen, you know, because by then, you know, I'm supposed to be looking to retire. But then I thought the heavyweight division is all tied up with Don, Muhammad Ali, that's where the big money is. The black-white thing still comes into it. Don had two chances, slim and none. But is Muhammad Ali the greatest? Second, no, is the greatest. <laughs> Ali, for my money, even if I don't have any, is the fact is that he's the greatest entertainer 
in all aspects of boxing and generally educating us as people. Because as a youngster growing up in Birmingham, when Ali talked about those who had come, um, when his resistance, he resisted the American government, the most powerful country in the world, he resisted them, the Vietnam War. You know, he said those Vietnam would never call me nigger. Which at the time we didn't fully understand it. But later on I could understand is the difficulty that he was having as a black man living in America and then going to they going to they are prepared to send him to go and kill other people in Viet Cong because of differences of policy. And now later on in years now when he said I fully understood it, I thought he was a great person. Pass my best. You know, I passed my best. Although Travisara, the Italian I fought. Um, I would have loved to have, I thought I would have loved to have been able to fight him, say, three, four years earlier. But that's the way life is. You have to fight as the opportunity arises. And there's no point in looking back. But he was a tough fight, not technically sound, but he was a tough fighter who wanted to win and he, he pressured me and they stopped it in the left round. The fight didn't come off straight away. For some reason, political, social, or whatever, this didn't happen straight away. So I ended up spending 12 months there. But when I went, left cold and soggy Birmingham and went uh, to Queensland, Australia, and when I saw the sunshine, I said to myself, oh, I could, li I could live here. <laughs> At the time, I didn't have any plans. I went there to fight, hopefully have a good fight and come back. And then eventually I ended up living there and spent seven years there before I came back. By this time, of course, I was well uh, retired. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But yeah, interesting country, interesting people. See, the thing is, Dennis Andrews, I was six years older than him, and whenever he began to turn 30, that's one of the things money does have to do. They have to pick the fighters well, <laughs> because however good you are, physiologically you begin to wane, you understand. And he was at the time, when I fought him, when I fought Dennis Andrews at about 31, 32 years of age, he was about 25, 26. But the style, he was not very pretty, the style, if you know what I mean. And he, wa he had that determination, he wanted the fight. He wanted a title, I should say. Well, I fought him twice, actually. I fought him in a non-title, and then after that, I fought him in the defense of a title, in which I won. Successfully defended it, and, uh, and as a result, had the, the Lonsay belt as my own. He was determined, he wanted to fight. Nobody wanted to fight him. Once I'm nominated, a champion has been nominated, I have to fight the, champion, the, the challenger. He was hard work, but I enjoyed it after. <laughs> yeah, I walked away from boxing when I was in Australia because by this time now I had decided to spend some time there because I stopped boxing after I lost to Axel. Steve Axel was a light heavyweight fighter they had there. And after I lost to him, I decided it's time. I had four fights in America, in Australia, winning two and losing two. And after I lost the last one, I said, it's time. Because one of the things I always read about during the course of my planning to be champion was that it shouldn't go on too long because this thing I like it to get hurt. And I always bore that in mind. And when the training gets too hard, they say, you see, as a youngster, you want to train, you want the gym, you want. Well, middle way, well, you still go there because you know you have to through knowledge. But later on, whenever it begins to get really painfully tough, you know, it's time to quit. So I use those uh, benchmarker to determine when I would quit boxing. So, so hopefully, 
save some of my faculties. In Australia, I um, I was associated with uh, one of the promoters that actually invited me over there, Peter Foster, very infamous uh, chap, Peter Foster. He'd have to re research him to find mm -hmm. out because he had uh, he had the uncanny gift to mix with the right people, and even when they know, he still were able to mix well. But at the time, he, uh, he, he attempted to do all the promotion, and me you now, with my experience and knowledge in the background, to get things together. See, I can talk to all the fighters and trainers and so on who respect me because of my history. He is a guy, he is a front man who sells the fight to the public. So, in my association, association with uh, Peter Foster, who has a, a history of <laughs> association with different people around the world. Um, that is what I enjoy doing. The background, out of the line, I've been in the line as a young man since 1970, 1968, you know. So I was ready to step back and let him be the front man, which he did. I had a boxing club in Birmingham, and uh, St. Teresa Amateur Boxing Club in which we produced one junior champion. But after that, you see, boxing is a very toxic sport, as you have guessed from your experiences in research. And um, after what, I got tired. You know, I was been box I've been boxing since 1966, at the 63 as a youngster. And after 20 odd years, in my 40s, mid 40s, and 50, I got tired. So I gave up the club to someone and um, decided to go into a night, not night, into a pub business. Mm -hmm. I don't know which is harder actually. <laughs> but um, I enjoyed the pub business more because I've done the boxing, I'd done as much as I could go, and uh, I decided to try something else. So I went into the pub business. And after three years, I got out of the pub business and uh, just lull around and enjoy the scenery around Birmingham. Well, mm, I have a lovely wife who uh, cares about me as you may be to detect from the way she fusses about a bit. Nice. I'm lucky. I hope you found you are you married? No. Mm -hmm. And um, we have two children we've been known we've known each other for about twenty odd years or thereabouts. I don't know. She knows the exact date and time. And we have two children, sixteen and eighteen. And um, I've retired from any sort of earnings and so on. Whatever little investment we had is already done. And she works sometimes when she has a mind to. So life's pretty good, except from the health department. Um, I had a, a blood clot a year ago. And I'm not too certain um, which developed into, what do you call it? Polymeric embolism. I'm still being treated. I don't even know what I'm being treated for. Because the polymer ball, oh, I'm taking blood thinning tablets, I says, which is to assist the movements of blood. If I have little bits and pieces, then of course it will swim with the rest. And I'll live here for another few years if yeah. I'm lucky. <laughs>